Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Let us know your name, your role, and where you're joining us from in the chat, and we'll get started shortly. Good morning, Elizabeth. Hello, Jamie. Hi, Lori. Hello, Carenza. Hey, Brittany. Hi, Justine. Hello, Teresa. Hello, Valerie and Diane. My favorite part is seeing um, from where everyone is joining us. It's so exciting to see all of the different places in the world people are coming from. Thank you all for joining. Hello, Tiffany. Hi, Aaron and Melissa. Hello, everybody. My name is Dina, and I am here from the Seesaw team. Thank you so much for joining us on day two of Seesaw Connect, or day one, if this is your first day joining us. I am so excited to welcome you to Redefining Learning on Seesaw, the Art of Innovative Task Design session led by James Radburn. Um, during this session, we really do encourage you to take notes, share insights, and be active while learning. Remember that you do get points on the leaderboard for being active during the sessions. On the top right, you'll see the chat for sharing and commenting. Next to it is the Q&A for asking the presenter specific questions. Uh, feel free to drop your questions anytime and we will answer them at the end if time allows. There is also a tab labeled handouts where any session resources will be shared. And if you'd like closed captions, uh, select the CC in the top right corner and choose your preferred language. Make sure to stick around till the end to get your PD certificate and to um, have a chance to win some prizes. But for now, I will pass it over to James. Hello, all, and welcome. And uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. It looks like we've got a whole range of people. I'm very excited for this. Um, yes, today's session is about redefining learning on Seesaw and the art of innovation task design. And I'm going to give you lots of nuggets, things to take away. But the biggest thing I want to give you and take away is the change of mindset about what tasks are. But before we go into that, going to explore who I am, the background and what we're doing here before I go and give you loads and loads of examples. And as we said earlier, there is a Q&A, so please feel free to put questions in there and we'll have some time at the end to go on about it. So my name is James Rabin. My official title is uh, Computing and Digital Innovation Lead. Very fancy, nice title um, that I actually wrote. But essentially my job, I am a primary school teacher. I've taught from um, reception all the way up to year six in England, in the UK. I'm in Worcestershire, which just south of Birmingham. And for the first time, there is a little bit of sun outside. So I'm hoping when we finish, I can actually go outside um, and enjoy that in the British weather. But I am part of 16 primary schools around the Worcestershire and Birmingham area of Samwell and Dudley. And I lead this idea of integrating technology into lessons um, through, through whatever subject, whatever domain it is. And we've recently just rolled out one-to-one -one iPads across all of our five and a half thousand pupils work for STEM um, and also do some stuff with the AI initiation group. And I hold a monthly radio show on Teachers Talk Radio where I've talked about task design, talked about um, AI, talked about education and a lot about ed tech as well. And so what we're going to explore today are four key areas. The why. And you may have heard of this science in learning quite a lot. It may have been something that is going through where you are at the moment, in your area, in your group of schools, in your district. Um, we're going to look at what that research says about technology and pedagogy, because that's really the foundation of what we should be building. Seesaw is a fantastic tool to deliver this but we need to understand what we're creating, why we're creating it before we can move it forward. 
And then we're going to look at this idea of pupil practice. What does it look like? I give you all the theory in the world and we can look at all the research, but that doesn't really help you to take away ideas and implement tomorrow or next week or when you come back to school after the summer break. And then also some of the top tips, some design ideas, some design choices. I'm going to just dump and uh, give you throughout the presentation the ways that help you as an educator in the classroom really transform. And I think one of the key things for you to understand is I work with teachers day in, day out, and with leaders within education. And all of this is built off my experience, but also research that I have looked at. And so I really want to go into why. Okay. Now, when we think about task design, task design, it seems quite a strange word if you haven't come across it before. And the key thing is this idea of in a lesson, you've got the instruction, you've got the task, and then you've got the assessment. The assessment of have the children learned it? And so often we look at the curriculum, but we haven't looked at how do we know the children are practicing that task? So practice, 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 so they can actually get that in there. But also, how do we know they have learned it? Now, if you heard of Pepton McCree, he's a prolific blog writer over in the UK and has written some amazing um, books. And one of the key things he write, he he's, he's written about which is a little bit controversial, but I like this idea that education and teaching is really, really difficult. And it's difficult because you can't see learning. Okay. If you're a brain surgeon, you can see exactly what you're doing to the brain. You can um, have a look inside. You can see the neurons going through. You can see the nerves. You can see exactly what you're doing. But when you're doing learning, well, how do you know Johnny over there is actually learning? Is he just merely copying from his partner and so making learning visible is a key phrase i'm going to be using throughout this process and to make learning visible we need to get this idea of are children thinking hard and i think that's the one question i want you to take away from today's session whenever you think about your lessons whenever you think about planning or whenever you're thinking about um, in the lesson itself are children thinking hard and if you can say confidently yes, you know that the task you have designed and where you're going is going to be productive, but also it's going to support you as a teacher to understand, right, this is exactly what they're learning, and also help the children be able to encode that into the long-term memory. But, and I think this is where the art of using Seesaw and technology is really, really helpful. Now, over in the UK, we have something called the Education Endowment Foundation. If you look for the EEF online, they've got some amazing um, research. And all they've done is taken loads of research and consolidated it into really clear summaries. And this is the one they created a few years ago. It talked about uh, the what are the four pillars. One is about consider how technology will improve teacher and learning before you introduce it. How it can support teacher quality of explanation and modelling how technology can offer ways to improve pupil practice so that immediate feedback and this idea of improving assessment and feedback. Now, there's been an awful lot of work, I, I think, really with tools to support with modelling, 3D models, if you've got AR, VR. There's loads of tools out there that's using assessment and the ones built into Seesaw are fantastic if you haven't used those, and I'll show you some of those later. But I don't think there's been enough on the ground work about what does pupil practice look like? And especially in the UK recently, we've really gone on this curriculum drive. What are we teaching our children? What's the schema we're doing? But we haven't really thought about what's that look like in practice. And I think that quality of teaching is a really, really important. And so therefore, not only do we have to balance our content knowledge, we've got to understand our pedagogical understanding of how do we deliver maths? Maths is going to be delivered completely different than if I was teaching children to draw. Um, I used to, when I was in year five, I used to have 30 children around my table and model drawing there. And they could see it. I'd often have an iPad over the top, screen record it. And then they have that um, model as on a like a slideshow, as a repeated video that would be on a loop that they can go and watch back. That was me con con um, combining the idea of the content that I needed 
the pedagogical idea of like they need to see this modeled and created from scratch from scratch from a blank page built up to like the shading of an apple but also it's using my knowledge of using technology and it's that intersection that we've got to really consider because we could just put technology in a classroom and it's going to make absolutely no difference we could be the best teacher in terms of we really know the science of learning but we don't know the curriculum well what are the children then actually learning and we can know the curriculum inside out but we don't know how to deliver that best for the children in our care and how we can use technology to really support that actually are we doing a disservice and so it's this interconnection that is a really good way to think and it's i use this as a thinking framework more than anything else now especially in England and the UK, and I know um, this has been part of the Wales curriculum that they've gone through and looked at, you may have seen that this model, and it's called the learning, learning model. And Dylan William started it off and had it through, and Tom Sherrington has done a lot of work over this in the last few years. It's a really good way just to think what is happening in the classroom. The first thing you've got to do is select that curriculum. Has the teacher selected the right ideas to teach? The second thing is this attention. Has the teacher got the student's attention? That third is you need to optimise that communication. Is the teacher presenting the ideas that is manageable for students? And we've heard of Ocean Shine. So principles, it's this idea of putting things in small steps. And I think it's this next bit, that driving thought. Okay. This idea that work and memory is not infinite. We've only got a small amount of information. And so what we've got to really consider is what do we want children to learn and how are we going to make them think hard about it? So is the children pushing children to think hard? If they are, then are our tasks really well designed so that children can practice it and practice it and practice it? And then they can encode that into their long-term memory and we can retrieve that back as a continuous cycle. It gives us an idea to gather feedback. It allows us to see, are the children actually um, learning? Are they responding appropriately? Are there misconceptions we need to address straight away in that moment before it goes too far? But it also gives us an idea to consolidate, consolidate what children need. And the use of technology and the use of CSO and how the ideas I'm going to show you today really will um, highlight this as a key element. And so if we know now what learning is, getting ideas into our working memory, being able to practice it to encode it to our long term memory, I really want to talk a little bit about task design before I go into what does this look like in practice? And when we get to that element of it, I've codified it. And um, I did a podcast recently about how we codified things too much. But this is a way for you to think about your task in such a coherent and succinct way that then you will have the power to really um, take it on, evolve it and be able to adapt it. But let's step back. What is task design? Well, it's that idea, the congruence between instruction, that task and assessment. And when we're planning tasks, we must always start with that core learning. Say you're teaching children about geography uh, of Europe. And where do you start? Well, with Europe as a whole, that's the context. That's the idea that you want to bring to the learning. You always need to start with that bigger picture, that wider context. And then you see them in a little closer. Do you need to look at the whole continent or do you need a specific case study? And ultimately, you want to know that children to know that Europe as a whole offers a huge expanse of physical geography but also human geography and you want to contrast this so you could take two countries and look at England and Italy or anywhere else you want to do and throw variations so you could have two countries and be able to choose two or three maps so they understand that and go throughout but then this is where task design really becomes the bridge between the curriculum and that student journey that student learning. And often we have a curriculum. This is what the children need to learn. Almost give it to them. Really simple tasks, not getting the children to think hard. And we think through osmosis, they will remember it. But that's not necessarily meaningful. It's not an engaging education experience. 
we need to create a process that transforms, transforms that content into dynamic, interactive adventure for the children. And I think this is where technology can really be the driving force behind this, is creating activities, assignments, and challenges that go beyond the mere completion of work. It gives all children the ability to be able to put their thoughts down on the page, so they're not given a blank piece of writing. If you go back to this idea that if children, you ask them to spend two or three weeks planning a story and you give them a blank piece of paper at the end and they write the story, they haven't gone back through that process of the weeks before, that amazing language you spent hours and hours of planning and working on and they don't use any of it. We've all had moments like that. So I really think about this as an idea of actually how can we get this curriculum into something tangible? So we want children to question to analyze, to synthesize information, draw that meaningful conclusion, because every child should be an active participant. There shouldn't be a hard way for children. It shouldn't be hard for children to participate in a lesson or to participate in an activity. And when we talk about activities today, some of these activities could be 30 seconds, they could be five minutes, it could be 10 minutes. We're not thinking about this as a whole lesson. We're thinking about this as a small, minute task, and that will come throughout. And so task design is just not a piece of the puzzle. It's a piece that makes the entire picture of a lesson, of a sequence, clear. It's a spark of curiosity. It fosters a lifelong learn of learning. It's a bridge between theory and practice and curriculum and student engagement. And so I have come up with five really core, simple ways that you can think about tasks and you can put them within a lesson. Now, if you really think about your lesson structure, you often do a retrieval, that prior knowledge, that, that understanding, do children have the prerequisites to be able to um, work within what I'm planned for this lesson? If they haven't, great, okay, I need to go and revisit stuff. Um, they have, yes, we can crack on and go through it. Then you often do a model. You explain the concept, the new concept, it could be about fractions, which is a really hard one that um, I know as a year three teacher trying to teach such an abstract con concept of what is a fraction into something meaningful. Um, instead of just having Oreos and breaking them in half, actually, how can we do this? But then it's also this idea that children need to practice it before they can do it themselves and before you can challenge them and make sure they master that concept. And so these tasks are really that, you may have heard this phrase, I do as a teacher, we do, and then they do independently. So it could be like this we do phase that some of these tasks fit in. They could fit in some of that prerequisite knowledge that you need to do with the retrieval practice at the beginning of the lesson. So these kind of tasks could be anywhere within a sequence of that lesson. And so they're quite short, they're quite quick, but we're gonna go through each of these five core ideas and there's some other research behind this, like generative learning, that I've taken some of these through and put them into tangible things that I've used in the classroom. I have got a few videos and a few examples as we go throughout this presentation that will really explain them. So let's start with the simplest idea, ranking and ordering. And I'm going to put this in here. It's not just putting things in order. And hopefully today I'm going to try and change your viewpoint. Because when you're thinking of ranking and ordering, you may think, okay, I mean, uh, year one, year two, cut and stick in, and I want children to put the time in order, or I want them to put these numbers in order, or I may have some fiscal mass manipulatives, I want them to put them in order. And yeah, they could do it. But how do you know Johnny over there is actually done it correctly? And can you see what he's done where Sarah over there and they manipulate it all and you've they probably cut a picture in half? And the amount of time you've wasted kicking the photocopy on a Monday morning because it's broken, you're trying to get to work to something that I can quickly create on Seesaw, use, manipulate, and just copy and paste and change it. And so it's a task they can do. Visually, you know exactly what you're doing when you're looking at that one. And if you look at the top one, the numbering between one and eight, it's the smallest, largest. There's an arrow, input a voice note on smallest, largest. Any child without any instruction can get on and do that. And you may have had do now activities. This is a brilliant one, come in and do it. But the task design behind this is, they're all on a dark blue at the bottom. Well, if I had iPads on the table, 
I can see straight away that Johnny over there, he's moved four of his already, but Sarah over there has only moved one. Well, actually, I need to go and see if Sarah, is she messing around or is she really confused? I can then physically go and see her, see how much she's done. Johnny, I know he's nearly finished. I can go to him and say, okay, right, the challenge. What number's missing? Can you make that and add it in a picture yourself? But the second one about the time, yes, I could put it in order, but then I can add the depth. Can you write the time underneath? Can you do it in digital? Can you write it in analog time? Okay. And they're really, really nice activities that are low stakes, but highly productive. Quick, drag, drop, really simple ideas that children can do, manipulate themselves. You can use the assessment features within Seesaw. So this was a part of um, what I was teaching at a school recently. And they were ordering and I wanted them to complete the number line. I've got a bar at the bottom again, you can see. And I've used the assessment feature here. Children have to drag these numbers in. And we were looking at about going up in the increments. I use this, the prior knowledge. I've never taught these children before. So I wanted to know, can they sequence and can they put numbers on a number line? Straight away, I had feedback saying, yep, they could. So we could move on. Or if I didn't have that feedback, right, I've got to stop here. And I've got to go over that prerequisite knowledge that the teacher had told me that they had the children clearly didn't because I created a couple of really simple activities that showed that. And I've had that as well. I've had that in the lesson where we looked at time. Time is notoriously hard to teach. And my thing with time is you've got to do it all the time. Um, but you've got to do it every single day, just drip feed it. But this teacher hadn't. And when I went into the class, they were meant to look at the duration of time. Well, when I did one of these prerequisite ideas, something like this, where the children could move stuff, manipulate it then i use the assessment feature three short really simple activities they couldn't tell the time so therefore that lesson that the teacher planned for me to deliver and for me to show her how we could use seesaw and task design straight away couldn't do that lesson because i made that learning visible i could tell that every single child in there apart from about two of them could not tell the time so therefore why are they teaching duration and making that learning visible is really simple. And the fact that you can manipulate things and move things, things can be really simple. We talk about sequencing a lot in early education. It could be sequencing pictures. Here is a great one in geography, sequencing what is the typical um, source. And you've got the tributaries in the mouth of the water or the river system. Put that in there. There's no right or wrong in there well there is a right and wrong but i haven't used the assessment features because what that allows me is then a discussion do this independently for two, 30 seconds by yourself right next minute you're going to talk to your partner what's similar with your partners what's different to your partners i can model mine up on the board i can have mine completely wrong um and if if i know the whole class have got theirs right i model mine airplane mine up onto the board do mine completely wrong and then they could actually pick holes in that. And so it's that idea of showing examples and non-examples and that discussion. I've got key language in there. I've got key specific language that when we're looking at the water cycle, they, I need children to really, really use this. So making that learning visible, having the idea of conversations, any child can come in. Those children who are non-verbal, those who have got severe SEN needs, they can order a picture. They're just maneuvering things. You can ask them really specific questions, go over to them. Okay, why do you think that this one with no water here um, comes second? Well, they, and then you you put it into words, may make children think, oh, it's got very little water, so therefore it must come first because I can just look at the amount of water in each one. That could be the level for some of the children, but some of them that go down, we could talk about the language. And Can you add any more in? Continuums are great because what it does, it highlights ideas and highlights patterns. And what you'll see between all these slides, there's a, there's a constant style that I've done with a lot of them. The blue bar at the bottom, but the top, um, there may be words that's listen and there's a voice note. I may have explained it to the children already. 
they don't need to listen to it. But if I've got someone who's come in for a music lesson, they can just click it and carry on. There's no need to write lots on the slide. I want it simple. I want it clear. I want it self-explanatory of what they're doing. And so this is taken, um, if you're in the UK, you may have heard of White Rose. They have loads and loads of resources, but they put these into columns. I was like, actually, I don't want to put them into columns because I want children to notice the patterns. So I did it on a continuum. And in doing this example, the children have noticed straight away that actually three sixths and four eighths are the same. So what language should we use in? Well, it should be equivalent. So therefore, I've got this idea of a reflection frame at the top, and we'll do that in an option. Click on there. What do you notice? Simple. Now, I've seen lots of teachers when they come to create these examples, and it's probably a frustration um, when you're supporting schools as well, when you're doing this, is you need to just don't take a screenshot of all of them. You want to take screenshots or copy and paste into Cecil when you're doing each individual thing. So children can manipulate it. They can show it. You can go over to them and move one deliberately and be that almost devil's advocate. What about this? Why is this wrong? And that language and that discussion and challenging children will allow them to practice, but allow them to encode that learning into their long term memory. But also a lot of this is there doesn't have to be a right answer. When you look at this, rank these synonyms for set. Okay, they could be a um, a continuum from the least effective to the most effective. It could be you could give them a context. So in this scenario, when I've got um, a character that's really angry, which one of these am I going to use? Okay, can you put them into the um, order the most appropriate? I'm going to have a completely different answer to Phoebe over there. Is that wrong? No, there's nothing wrong about it. But I've got my opinions. But you, the, the learning comes from justifying it. OK, why? Why I think exclaimed is more powerful than screamed. OK, and then Phoebe may explain why screamed is more powerful than exclaimed. And then the discussion as a class goes on to what is the most appropriate? And if you read any Roald Dahl books, he uses said. Because sometimes. The simpler, the better. We've got into a, a, a kind of a rut of let's add more and more. But when we think about language and think about precision, we need precise language. And that's why Seesaw and these ideas that you can give the children, they can use these. Imagine if you had that. They've got that continuum. You're looking at different synonyms for said. They have that in front of them and they've got the exercise books and they're writing out. They've got a natural scaffold there. They can take the ideas and they can use them really, really well. And so it's this idea that you're not splitting their attention between different things. All of those activities look simple on the face of it, but actually you've got a lot of potential for every single one of them. How can you challenge? How can you support? It's removing that admin. You are not at the photocopier. You're not cutting and sticking. You're not giving Johnny another sheet of paper because once again, he has cut it. It's not glue everywhere. They can do these quickly, get into the learning, and you could be more productive. Not necessarily cover more, because what you get is the depth. And I think that's the key idea, questioning, challenging. And it's those ideas that are really, really help. Second idea, true or false. And I kind of started going over some of these ideas quite simple already. This could be about anything. And the nice thing with um, what I've used on Seesaw is that you can have a, I have slides that are templates and I can copy and paste this. It's really simple, advantages, disadvantages, I've used frames, there you are. And it could be a discussion that we do as a class. Can you bullet point your five ideas? What's the advantages of um, banning afternoon break? And what are the disadvantages of it? Okay, great. You've done that independently. Let's show it as a table. Let's show it as a cast. What can you add? Really simple ideas, but you can visually see, okay, straight away, they may find advantages a lot easier to a concept. So you can see, okay, they haven't got many ideas and disadvantages. That's the one that I'm going to play as a teacher, and that's the one that I'm going to give them, and I'm going to really challenge them. And it's that idea of making that learning visible, 
The children's ideas aren't in their heads. They are concentrating. They're putting something out in a quite a, um, a blank sheet of paper in an exercise book can be quite intimidating. This is some, this is simple. This is really easy. They can dictate ideas into it. They can bullet point. They can type. They can write. All of those things. The fact that they're very multimedia and really awesome with things like this. But it's ideas like this as well. Here's an example. Now, I gave these to training teachers before, and I gave an um, example of fractions, and I was like, I was saying, right, well, this is correct. Showing them, I even created a visual there, and I wanted them to prove it to me. This is a fantastic example. Look at the denominators. Well, they can't add up, so why can't they add up? Well, show me, prove it to me. Use the manipulatives that you've got. The children, the, they could use the voice, they could talk about it, they could take a, I wanted them to use the manipulatives, whether it's a digital manipulatives on their um, app or on their iPad or on Polypad online, or whether it's using the physical ones that they've got. Um, but I wanted to give non-examples because what we often learn is a lot more from challenging and non-examples than we are do from saying, yep, that's great, let's move on to the next one. And that's where no depth comes. So always challenging, always think about the opposite bit. And proving it is really, really a nice way of looking at it. The other question, I've done some research for the Mass Hub in the UK recently about digital learning. And we did, what do you notice? What patterns do you notice? Because mathematicians, scientists, it's all about pattern recognition. What do you actually notice? What is happening here? If I change that variable, this is what happens. And they're really, really important. And it, these help with those ideas. But I think this is where task design can come into its own. This idea about organizing ideas. So this is, um, this is, this is one of my favorite ideas of using. So we could get children to order the sequence in the pictures. I've done that before. Great, brilliant. But here we wanted to look at that tier two, uh, tier three language we wanted children to use. So we've got the sequence in first, second and third, given the pictures already to the children because we've discussed this. But underneath, I've added these new feature called frames and allow children to respond. And I've got a video that will go through this in a second. But with each of those, my key element here is I want children to have something low stakes, something for them to practice, but then it gave them an option that if I practice this on Seesaw, I can open up my exercise book. I've already practiced it quite low stakes. I can then write this up and refine it as well. So they've almost got two drafts straight away. But I can give children a challenge. Can you use two of those uh, languages above? Or can you use more? If I was looking at... Um, I wanted them to use prepositions. You can see there's a one preposition up there. I could have filled those all with prepositions. If I wanted them to look at expanded noun phrases, I could have put the expanded noun phrases I want them to use. Because what you're giving children the opportunity for, and we don't do this enough in education, is the idea of rehearsing. Can you rehearse your sentence? Can you, re can you record it? Listen back to yourself. And I've had children who have done this, recorded something, listen back to themselves. They've self-corrected. They self-edited their own work because they're listening to it. And the fact that we can add these multimedia elements, really, really powerful. Now, if you haven't used frames, it's a really, really nice way of um, use, putting them into practice. So you'd click on the tick at the left-hand side and you click on frames. And you've got the option, photo, video, voice, record, label, or upload. And you've got the student choice. So I could put the student choice in, drag it below, and I can basically duplicate that. Now at the top, you see that preview as a student button. Um, it's always good to test these things out. Child could test, you can test this out. Um, they could dictate into this if you wanted to, so if they've actually got something written there. I've asked them to go through and have a look. And it's a fantastic way of scaffolding that learning. This is accessible to every child within that classroom. It's not complicated. It's a really easy way to organize that learning, make it visible and make it easy to follow as well. This is another one. 
about what do you notice and this is a massive research project and part of this we did we took um, some really old brilliant resources from um, the DFE, our department for education years and years ago they came out with problem solving and one of them for i think it was year one year two was this idea of damn through three bean bags each bag went into a bucket more than one bag go into the bucket so we wanted the children's what's highest three ways to make six three ways to make nine what are the other scores and there were frames there and we asked the children to take pictures um, using the manipulatives because that was the other thing we wanted what we wanted to make sure we didn't use everything digital we still wanted these manipulatives that children used so this therefore encouraged them to do it but it says what do you notice and this is a recording with one of our uh, lower able students who had a conversation with a teacher about what this looked like and what they sounded like and what did they notice so we could capture that and they could rehearse that as well hopefully the sound will work on this okay erin how many objects did we have three we did we had three and how many different scores could we get we could get one two three or four okay and what was the highest score we could get using the three objects I can't remember. What was the highest score? Four. Yes, the highest score was four. So if we got four, 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 we could get 12, couldn't we, all together? We just added that up. What about, what was our lowest score we got? Number one. Yeah, and if we got three objects in one, it would be one, two, two three. Three in total, wouldn't it? So we could have three objects that get different totals depending on what score we threw. Didn't now most of the children would be able to do that independently but that was a scaffold that was easy accessible for that child before they could build on and do some of this work independently and balance with that it's a great way of setting seesaws also a great way like i said earlier of setting up templates and copying and pasting them and changing context this is a um, way that you could compare and there's a book called Organising Ideas, and they've got loads of these diagrams out there like flowcharts. But what is what is the same between a bird and an insect? What are the features? You need to come up with three. Well, that's actually quite difficult, but let's come up with three. Okay, what's different? What sets an insect apart? What sets a bird apart? And visually, you can see, okay, which area they're struggling with. Great, that's what I need to focus my time and energy in exploring. Simple idea. But making that learning visible is so powerful and so impactful for you as an educator because you don't know what's in their head. And there are only so many questions you can ask a child. The child will be guessing and just saying something that they want you to hear as well. And when we did a lot of this research and when we shared a lot of these mass ones, we found out that the children and the, te the teacher said it's more of an honest reflection of their work, of exactly where they are. And I think that's that's so powerful and so meaningful. And what we need is we need to really see what children are thinking. You can go for some really simple ideas to something really, really complex. So taking this idea, concept maps, I've done this nice and big before, cut them out, also done it on Seesaw. But it's this idea of Roman Britain and come in, okay, what's why has it happened? And they're just hexagonals about them coming into britain um these three things link okay this left britain open to from attack and the british asked for help with the two of these they're just ordering ideas they're ordering their concepts they've learned over weeks and weeks put into something there before they go and do a news report or before they go and write up a report of something and the fact that you'll see lots of examples um if you ever see any of our schools where they would have the exercise book and that there in front of them because this is their scaffold they've done a lot of their work and this is how it's going to help them it is a natural scaffold we often talk about how can we be adaptive in our teaching how can we support children so we're not staring at a blank page and there's a whole idea of language and vocabulary it also gives them the children to for metacognition thinking about it themselves okay i can reflect we had this of children doing Numicon when they did one of these mass problems. What do you notice? They recorded the explanation and realised 
oh, my diagram's wrong. I need to go and take another picture. They went back, did another picture, and they learned on that. Teacher didn't need to mark that. That first effort, no, it's wrong, and then had to go back a day later. The children weren't in the right mindset. They didn't actually know what that task was. They had to go back to it. They got that feedback immediately because we're giving them that opportunity for immediate feedback. And I think one of the biggest things is that oracy development. I often say to my teachers, you can get 30 children recording in a room. It's going to be noisy, and you're not going to listen to 30 children. But what it has given them is this idea of practice. The children are practicing that language. So when you go and have that conversation with um, Sarah over there, actually, she's already practiced it once, and then you've gone to her, and you can listen. And it's so really nice ideas that you can have in there. Another idea, labeling. And I'll show you two different uh, versions of what labeling looks like and what you can do. And so this is... Um, in the mass, in the computing curriculum in the UK, and I know very much in maths as well, is labeling and classifying. So here I've got the simple idea of four pictures, four, well, four circles. Can you label them? But what you'll notice is that I've put uh, more labels than other things. So they can't guess. They've actually got to think about it. And they've got to think about why is that label there? The other way is you give them the labels um, already on these, and then they move the objects into it. So always think about there are two ways of doing things. Don't Normally, you would be able to give them circles, you give them labels, you give them something else, then they've got to think about it, okay? You could also say, what's the odd one out? There's one that's wrong in this. Why is it wrong? Can you notice it? They could put their labels in there, and you say, okay, I'm going to add in a penguin or something. Where would this go? Why wouldn't this go in this one? Why couldn't something else like that? And being able to hold one back and challenge, I think, is really, really important. And we've done that idea when we thought about the Antarctica um, and the North Pole, and we've looked at actually, what are the differences? Okay, can you compare these? Can you say which one is Antarctica for definite? And then we've added in pictures to challenge their thinking, to justify their reasoning and understanding. Really good ways of being able to think about text markup. Um, we often do lots. I know in the UK we have often it is in displays in English. We highlight the different features, what we've got, but being really precise, going down to a sentence or something of um, paragraph level, being really precise, okay, highlighting. It's really simple to highlight. The colours are already there. The children on this example can m move those, draw a line. They can use the colours. They can highlight. They can go however they want to manipulate it. They can manipulate it. But what you're seeing in all of this is the quality and the expectation is high about the presentation. And I've had that quite a lot before. Okay, why? How can we make sure that the work on Seesaw is as high quality as what they've got in their books? Because actually... We've got this in our head that setting up work in our books that looks pretty is learning is happening. Well, it's not necessarily true, but there is something about organizing. And you see like the backgrounds, there's consistency behind them. The fonts are consistent and things like that. Now, one of my favorite things is that idea of practice. And here is um, I've kind of messed around with this and it's probably not the neatest way of doing it. Um, but I'll, I'll show you a video and try and talk you through how labeling is a really I um, do now activity it's really really powerful so this is locating european countries um, and if by magic i have a video that goes along with this so this is using the assessment features um, so click on the tick and click on the question now you'll notice there are different um, modes so you've got the practice mode and the practice mode will you'll see the eyes the children can check the answers i don't want the assessment mode on this i don't want to them um, to put it in and immediately find out i want children to have as many goes as they want this is the part of the process that i don't mind i'm going to put the question locate the european country this one's uk i want to drag and drop um i don't want the classical is when you've got multi steps click that add now you'll notice you have all these boxes so i've already set up my map and the arrows united kingdom i want that as an option at the top here's the box they drag it into um, if you drag it like that Make sure, and I haven't done it in this one, that that United Kingdom 
actually fits in that drop now quite nicely. Now, you'll notice this title here. I don't want that title. So all I do is click delete and it's gone. So once again, at the top, I'll click preview as a student. I can check it works. So when I drag it in, you see I have to mess around with it in a minute. Yeah, it's not working. Click it. I can see I've got the answer right. Now, as a teacher, if you've done all of those, you'll come back and see how many attempts it's taken them. So you get that assessment data, you get that back, but it's quite low stakes for the children. They can practice it, practice it, and it's that making that progress, making sure that they can code that into the long-term memory. We don't get things right first time, and it's so low stakes. So that's my hack on how to, you can create labeling diagrams like this, something that's so powerful and so easy to do. So it's opportunities for rehearsal, and it's that oracy as well. Now, I'm going to really quickly go through this last one uh, about matching, and then we we'll ha should have some a little bit of time for some questions as well. So once again, I said about on the right-hand side, you've got there, you can put um, sky, land, water, they can match things, put things into diagrams. And on the left-hand side, this was all about angles. Now, you've got to be really clear and clever about what are the visuals you want to use. So on these for the obtuse, you've not only got the angle that's actually written there, you've got a diagram uh, without the angle written there and just a different shape. So given variation of examples for children to practice, and what it gives you is the ability for you as a teacher to go through and say, okay, you're accurate there. Can you write a definition? What acute is, what obtuse is, what reflex is? And you don't necessarily need to give them the answer that they're correct. You just give them that challenge. And then once they've written, because that writing that definition may allow them to think about, okay, are you correct? The other way I do is go onto their work and just say, think about this one and get them to focus on one, one of them and say, okay, are you 100% are you sure that's correct? And then they think about it. They may move it into another one. Okay, well, you've moved it. Now what a definition, were you correct? And sometimes I'll do that even if they are correct. Um, and it's it's not for me to try and catch them out. It's for me to make sure they're confident about their rationale. Because I don't want children to think I'm always going to pick one that's wrong or one that's always right. And it's brilliant because there's a mass curriculum over here in the UK that they always know one of their characters is always wrong. So when they do a reasoning or problem solving, so of course he's wrong. And anyone can write that, but they're just guessing. They don't actually know. So making it clear, making their learning visible and challenging the children to really justify what they think about is really helpful. Left hand side. Present past, really simple idea, not complicated. Okay, present past, how do you know? Okay, it's the verbs, highlight the verbs. Okay, if you're right, it's the verbs. You've highlighted them, you circled them, write your own present and past. You can then know what the rule is because a lot of grammar is all about rules. Any child can do that. You can, if you put voice notes on each of those sentences, they can then go back through and listen to them and they listen to those and often you'll they'll be able to hear it so it's a fantastic way this one on the right hand side you'll see it's got the um, main clauses the same seeds need light to grow but they've got different different conjunctions because but and so and this idea is from the writing revolution and what i want them to do is think about what is the course of that conjunction as well as the science so it's a bit of grammar a bit of science in there drag and drop put it in doesn't matter if you've got it wrong. We'll talk about it. Does it sound right? Great. Okay. And that's kind of a really nice, simple, low stakes way of looking at conjunctions, but also underlying something that they've done before as well. Really simple because, but and so put the conjunctions in and they all mean something slightly different. But I bet you've never thought about that level of detail just about three conjunctions before. It's a really simple, really easy way. And so I've kind of put some things here as reflection for you to think about because task design is actually what is that concept and how do you want children to engage how can you structure the tasks that demand not only engagement with the concept but what you want to teach how can you enable children to practice and apply those key learning concepts to get them to think and it's that idea what do you want the child to think about how can you make this simple and clear even the structure of how you design the task that's consistent that comes in like drag and drop done 
put it on the table, right? Come in, do the first two slides on Seesaw without with very little explanation. Go in, I know exactly where they are. Great, I can move on or I can readdress something. Or I know those six children over there, when we come back to do our independent task, I'm going to bring them over on my table and work with you. I can be adaptive in the moment. But also, how can you vary? How can you offer the depth? How can you challenge them? How can you give them non-examples? Because within all of these, you've got the opportunity for or rehearsal. You've got the idea of vocabulary. You've got this idea of it's a natural scaffold as well. Hopefully, from there, you've got some ideas and really thinking about what does a good task look like. And each of those could be a really quick task, five-minute task, but the thought and process behind them is the really powerful and really helpful. Thank you for listening this afternoon. We've got 10 minutes um, for any questions or answers through that. And thank you for all the engagement, um, especially in the chat that I've seen throughout the process. Yes, thank you so, so, so much, James. Um, the chat has certainly been on fire. Everyone has been so excited, myself included. I was like sitting at the edge of my seat the whole time waiting to see what you were going to throw at us next. Um, and I know that everyone has definitely taken away some new tasks that they can incorporate into their classrooms this year. Um, to our audience, just as a reminder, this session was recorded and it will be available um, on demand as of tomorrow. So you'll be able to go back and uh, rewatch all of the awesome ideas that James has shared with us today. But for now, um, we do have a couple of questions. James, I'm going to grab those for you. Um, let's see. Sylvia is asking, are these activities available in the Seesaw Library? I love all of these ideas and would love a template to work from to change it into Chinese. Um, Sam, so what I'm doing is building out these more and more. So I've got, if you look at the Seesaw Library, I've got one called Rankin already, and I've got loads and loads of ideas in that. Um, some of these, some more as well and that. And what I'm doing over the next few weeks is building more and more and more of these um because i think one of the things i know Pep mccree talks about it is for teachers to really get this they've got to see it and as you've seen today i've kind of challenged your thinking of what traditional learning could look like and given you different viewpoints on things so the more examples you can give them there will be so yes i am building out some if you look on the seesaw library there's one called banking um, dash task design take that one use that start that off and then there'll be more and more um, coming out as well thanks james um i think we all really loved that map activity myself included shauna is wondering specifically how do you mark the correct answers for the map drag and drop activity so the one if you haven't explored the um, assessment features that's really, really powerful to look at it. And I've kind of used it what I wanted what more than actually what it was in probably initially designed for. So there are two different assessments. Well, there's more than two, but there's two kind of core different assessment types. So there's a practice and then there's the assessment. So this one, the map for the practice, you can see you've got a little eyes. The children can do it. You've got a green tick. If it's more than one go, it will say. And if it's red, there. Now, when you're thinking about when they submit it and when they click the green tick, you'll get that feedback as a teacher. You'll get all the names. You'll see how many attempts it took for them to do it. So sometimes when you're thinking about a lesson, if I was in a classroom, I always say iPads flat on the table. And the reason for that is I can stand in the middle of the classroom and see how many items the children have moved off the bottom or how many green ticks they have quite visually for that. But if I wanted something at the beginning of a lesson and I really needed that feedback straight away and I couldn't wait to the end of the lesson I'd almost have two activities for that lesson do the prerequisites get them to do the ticks and submit it so I can get that feedback straight away notice okay those six children don't know what they're doing we need to go and address that or um, if I can wait to the end of the lesson I've got a good idea um, and it is something like map something low stakes like maps that actually that's just that's a rehearsal or something we've done a couple of weeks ago and it's it's not going to be integral to that lesson um 
it may be something I'll address at the beginning of the next lesson um, if I've got that feedback. So have a look at the assessment features because when they do submit it, you get that you get that feedback. You don't get that feedback when the activity is still live and they haven't submitted it. That's probably a key thing to point. Thank you so much. And um, one last question from Michelle. Michelle is asking, how do you manage early finishers who finish a CESA activity quickly? Challenge. Depth. <laughs> and I think the key thing is questions. You always got to look. Some of these ideas are, are deliberately quick. Okay. So one of the easiest ways to challenge um, children is create your own example. Um, and that works with 99% of the tasks. And I don't like it. And I've been in schools and some of our own schools that the children don't finish a task. That's it. Well, actually, how do you know they've learned something? You've just completed an activity. There's no necessary learning there. It may look like, but when you dive into it afterwards, like now they haven't understood the concept. So create your own example is a lot more difficult than it sounds. And that's why we're teachers. We're taking something quite complex, trying to segment it and break it down for children. That takes a lot of cognitive um, power for us. So giving it back to the children, saying, okay, let's fill this in, let's rank these, or let's label this. Now create your own example. Create your own example for a map where they just put a map there and, okay, label three other countries. That's a really simple one. Um, it could be lots of different things like that. So, yeah, those ideas are really, really powerful. So just think about, create your own but always think about what are the questions that if i need to support children but also if i need to challenge them as well and often it's language it's like okay use three more examples or can you use a relative clause in this or can you use a subjunctive form in this or for example wonderful well thank you so much james and again thank you everyone so much for attending we are going to do um the fun part where two people are going to win a prize so let's see who the winners are. Drum roll, please. Yay, our winners today are Marianne Cunningham and Laura Lee Stolzoff. Please stay tuned for next week. We'll reach out to you uh, with more information about how to claim your prizes. Again, thank you so, so much, James, for this wonderful session. And thank you, everyone else, for attending. Um, hope to see you all soon and have a wonderful rest of Seesaw Connect Day 2. Thank you all. Take care. Take care.